Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of the Ultimate Effort Show with Joe and that other guy. And uh, we, we have the other guy. We have another special guest with us this morning. None other than one of my favorite DMs, uh, Dennis Smithson, regular DM and player in our multi crew game. Um, mm-hmm. If this is the first time you're meeting Dennis, everyone, I, you may have seen his handle around the Runehammer Discord. Mm-hmm. He is an outstanding DM and uh, contributor. Um, frankly, one of my super secret DM confidants. Um, generally somebody that I trust in terms of his opinion and decision opinions and decision making about the hobby. Um, Dennis just, you know, he's just squared away and has a great take. So we're excited to have him with us. We want to dive into his origin story here, which uh, I'll let Joe run. And, um, and then we're going to go behind the, sh- behind the sheet today where we're going to talk about origin stories. No, sorry. <laughs> We're going to talk about why, charisma. Why did I say that? <laughs> We're going to talk about charisma-based characters. And then we're going to go uh, behind the screen from the DM standpoint. And we're going to talk mm-hmm. about rooms and scenes. And yeah. taking your design, especially when you're starting out, uh, down to sort of a micro level. Yeah. Yeah. Discrete spaces versus the open world. Exactly. So all that's coming at you here in just a second. But first, Dennis, let's talk about you, man. Let's uh, let's uh, let yeah. people kind of get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, well, that's then, a very uh, flattering intro. We should probably just pull the pin here and let me go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, I mean, we could, but like then we would miss the tradition. It's you, we're, we're we've got this tradition here on the origin stories, man, and we gotta. We got to hear it. You What's can, the origin story? You can Venmo me later, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right? Was was it the uh, radioactive spider bite? You know what's what's going on here? Were you born with these superpowers? Yeah. No, my uh, I started back in grade eight. We had just moved from one community to another, and I was trying to make new friends. And some of the guys I was hanging around with at the time were playing this game called Dungeons and Dragons. I had never heard of it, and they asked if I wanted to join in one weekend, and about 14 hours later of Slurpees and 7-Eleven runs, uh, I was hooked. Um, Those I were the days. my first character, 3D6 down the line, and had a, oh, nice. started with a Barbarian. We were playing second edition AD&D. Um, yeah, had a bar- Barbarian that only drank orange juice, and we went <laughs> into the Temple of Elemental Evil. That was my introduction to... Uh, to D and D way back in the time. Yeah. That's a that's a good one. Oh, that was a, that was a good module back in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I had no idea what I was doing. They just told me to roll. Yep, and I didn't know to roll. <laughs> right, man. I'll let you in on a secret. I still have no idea what I'm doing. You know, some thirty plus years later. <laughs> but we're having fun doing it, and that's the important part, right? Yeah, that was it. That was it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't understand Thacko. You know, only my buddy Rodney did, right? So. What, you know, whenever we would play, like I w- we would have to look to him for the roles. Like, like what am I rolling again? Like, what do oh, I man. need to hit? So, man. I had a complete and firm grasp of Thacko because on the official character sheet, right along the bottom, they had a track where you could circle what your you know what yeah. your level or stat was, and then it would tell you what you needed to roll. Other than that, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, we didn't even have official character sheets. We were probably doing it wrong. I don't know. <laughs> what do you need to beat in six? Oh, great. I hit. <laughs> but that takes me right back. And then rolling down the line, man, like that is that is pure classic D&D. Right. I still like doing that. <laughs> did um did it so how long were you guys like just, you know, just playing D&D like that? Did it did that last for a while? Yeah, probably 3 or 4 years until we hit high school and then things got busy and everybody kind of went their own ways, right? Mm-hmm. And then for several years after that probably right up until almost about when 5e came out it was pretty dry for me I, you'd find a game here and there but most of them would die off real quick or fail before they even started and then um actually one day at work just about when 5e was coming out i picked up the that book and i was reading through it and having a conversation with some of the guys i work with and we were talking about 
what we do on days off to to burn off the stress and some of the stuff that we deal with at work and uh the one guy brought up that he was playing role-playing games on the computer and another one mentioned that he missed playing tabletop rpgs I'm like well why don't, don't we say yeah <laughs> you don't say i just happen to have this book that just came out with these new rules and uh yeah, not that, that uh, created. I now have a tabletop group for first responders here in Calgary. Um, we have a group of 15 of us at most. Uh, obviously, we don't all play at the same time, but whoever can make it at whatever game. And it's everything from law enforcement, uh, EMS, fire, teachers even, and uh, yeah. some of the people in the community as well that want to join in and just need a break from the stuff that we see and do. And meet with some good people yeah Man, so that's that's, that D's become my therapy at times <laughs> right, right yeah you know it's funny i've it heard a is. lot of people say that absolutely mm -hmm. um I who, mean, who they even use it uh to little sidetrack i guess uh they they do even use it for that specifically yeah. now there is like a, a whole thing about using this to to help people you know um i, I don't want to say deal with to help cope and overcome you know with with uh you know just all the different junk that kind of gets spooled up up there, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious, Dennis. Mental health, folks. Important. Yep. I'm curious, <laughs> Dennis. Who who DM that group? Was it you when you pulled everybody together? Were you in the DM seat? Yeah, I was. Yeah. <laughs> nice. 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 Yeah. Did Did you do that before? Back when you were in high school? Like like when did you when did you jump into the DM chair? Yeah. Uh, in high school, I was a player. Uh, I didn't jump until. I think it's because I we just couldn't find a game, right? So then you start thinking about, well, you know, if I ever got to run one, here's what I would like to do. And and then um, once I finally had a group, it was, they, had, they hadn't played in years and I had read, read the book because I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And I had, read, man, what, third edition and fourth edition. And I, like, I would just pick the books up whenever they would come out and have a read. And I was always down at the, the big old hobby store not too far from my house with hundreds of books in it and floating around there on days off and yeah i just i took the helm i guess if lack of a better way to put it and put the game together and said everybody meet me at my house this night and nice. we'll order some pizza and, nice. roll some and so, we're what seven years into that now oh nice that's epic it's a good run so did you uh did you get much chance to explore other game systems or was it just primarily in the uh the D D? I've read a lot of them. Um, the majority of the games I've played actually have been either 5e or ICRPG. Um, I've read Legend of the Five Rings, um, Worlds Without, was it Worlds Without Number? All, he, Alex has seen my book collection. It's rather, <laughs> it's rather obscene, actually. The doc here, my, my wife wonders why I have so many books, but I'll still pull one out every now and then and just read through it just to get some ideas or something different, right? Yep. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's important not to get locked into one rule set or one way of thinking. Because um, at the end of the day, we build these games for us and our friends. We don't build them for the rules that we're in. If yeah. that's that's my philosophy, anyways. That's a good philosophy. I mean, one I know both Alex and I I share. I mean, well, you you know that too. Like, we we see each other most every weekend. Uh, yeah. You know, di digitally, of course, because yeah. we're all spread around the country. Or around the northern continent, I should say, because mm -hmm. you know, two two countries, right? Bridging the border <laughs> gaps. Yeah, our game is international, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, when did you find Runehammer? When did you find ICRPG? And um, do you, do you even like it? <laughs> do you I even like it? Like the system? <laughs> That's a terrible system. I don't know why anybody would play it. Um, no, I was actually stumbling around YouTube one day and I came across this crazy guy with this Runehammer channel making um, videos about room design and such. And now the rest is history. I, I don't know, been what, how how many years has he been up on his Discord and running his, his stuff now? Well, I, mean, I was one of the early ones. Seven one years? Man. Yeah, like six or seven years for, for the YouTube. Yeah, I, ICRPG came out in 2017, I think roughly around May or so. Uh, you know, obvi uh, yeah, obviously Hank was putting you know the the, the videos that sort of led to that out a, a year or two before that. Yeah, 
So I remember the old Google Plus. Wasn't there a Google Plus page yeah. or something like that? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's, yeah. Rest I, well, Google Plus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. What attracted to me that was the philosophy of it. It wasn't rigid. It wasn't again. I, I'm very free flowing when I run games. I'm. Uh, I hate rules lawyering and I hate power gaming. I shouldn't say hate. I dislike. Hate's a strong word. I dislike power gaming. I, um, I think your best characters come out of the ones that aren't stats driven or personality driven or have flaws. But um, and the, the the stuff that B was putting out there resonated and I just hung around and started implementing those those rooms. I yeah. ran ran my table group through um the prisoners of Morlock or uh Morlock. Yeah, Morlock. Yeah. Well, Morlock, yeah. I was in yeah. Morlock and thinking of been watching Lord of the Rings again. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. No, that's good. Like it's definitely like a, a great philosophy, you know, pushing forward is that you know it, it kind of like reaffirms that fact of of it's the people at the table that are the game, not the rules in the book. Yeah, it's yes. not the Pringles. Yeah, well, that's the Pringles. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, I think if I didn't enjoy hanging around you guys, right? Like, you know, why why would we do it? You know, <laughs> so it, that leads us maybe into something fun that I want to share, which is sort of how you know we met, Dennis, and and that is you know I think the first time I ever played with you was in Chuck's game, so uh, Texas Grenadier on the Runehammer Discord, uh, aka Chuck. Uh, I think Chuck pulled us in a game. I think we were both playing Lizard Men. I think I was playing Slass and you were playing Yis. I, I yep. think that's right. Yep. And um, we both had sort of these creepy lizard dudes who, who kind of bonded. I guess we'd come from the same tribe or whatever. Uh, or same clan. So So that was pretty awesome. And then, I don't know that I talked to you a whole lot, but then I sent out a feeler for the Guardians of the Galaxy parody. The, yes. the, the protectors of the quadrant game that I ran. Yep. yep, I think that was my I think that was my first game with you. Yeah, uh, when when we played together, were uh, what was it? I was gut sack the the goblin, yep. and and you were uh, shrew. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yep. And, and so what what was great about <laughs> that, so you know, was, right? So we had we had uh, Dave Thalmavor who was playing our captain, um, and and he decided that he was going to be sort of a charisma based character, so that sort of fell in line, and then. Gutsack the Goblin was sort of like a rocket raccoon type. Yeah. And now I, I do want to say, like, that kind of happened accidentally. We were making yep. our characters and we all kind of looked and went, holy shit, we made or we made the Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yep. The protectors of the quadrant. Right. Yeah. And trademark. Uh, yes. And Greg, <laughs> uh, if you know him from the Runehammer forums, Big Grump, uh, yep. he, he was playing sort of a Dax kind of rage based character. Mm -hmm. And Dennis came in and I was like, he's like, I said, you know, it's sort of turned into this weird parody, man. You know, and, and that's all I sort of gave him. And he came up with a Groot sort of spinoff, Sh Shroom, right? I guess was his name. Is that right? Yep, Shroom. Who, uh, I'll, I'll let you spill the beans on how he responded to every question, because it wasn't Groot. <laughs> nope. The only word he knew was yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even when the answer was no, it was yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was, you, you did such a great job in terms of your RP, like, it, you know, just like group, like in terms of what you conveyed with one word and the tone and inflection and all that. Yeah. Uh, that was a, <laughs> that was awesome. a super fun game. And, and right. I think then from there, that's sort of how we, you know, we sort of formed the moldy career, like from, from there, mm -hmm. like I was starting to run a new ga game, the demon lands game. Um, and I need another player. And at the same time, Dennis, you were just like, hey, man, uh, you know, if, if you got any openings, I'd love to play another game. And next thing you know, you know, it, we were doing it weekly from then on. And what I would say to a lot of folks is we all met through the Runehammer community. Like, that's how we came together. And I can honestly say, looking back at this stage, um, playing and DMing in some of these games have been probably some of Rich the best best games I have ever played. Some of the best time I have ever spent with folks um, have, have been with you guys. Yep. So that Indeed, I second that. Like, I'm totally going to pull the parrot and be like, you know, yes. <laughs> the shroom moment. <laughs> uh -huh. shroom. <laughs> so that leads us to maybe the next thing. And, and we'll talk about some of this maybe when we get to behind the screen. But 
I'm curious, Dennis, you know, what are, what have been some of your favorite games that, that you've played or DM'd um, throughout the years? And it doesn't even have to be multi crew stuff. Like, what have been some of the, mm -hmm. some of the best ones that you've been in? Um, online wise, I think just about every one of our games, well, I can honestly say every one of our games I've enjoyed. Um, the Chuck's game there at the number 21 extra spicy with the old, the shootout at the noodle house. I think. <laughs> Well, yeah. What a great way to start a campaign, right? Yep. That's still one of my favorite scenes. You know, yep. we're, me and Alex were just talking about that uh, last night, in fact. I, I yep. cited the Noodle House. Yep. Yeah. Um, great start. The Demon Lands was a great campaign as well, too. And it was one of the first ones where I felt fully immersed in a character. Like Shroom, Shroom was, I was immersed in him, but he was almost kind of gimmicky. Yeah. Uh, at, because he was based off of somebody else, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The Demon Lands characters, there were so many, and they were so rich, and there was something at stake for each of them, right? Yeah. They, they were all connected together, so when Joe lost to, like, his 15th character in that campaign, I think, <laughs> um, you know, it still hurt. It still, you know, yeah. there was that emotional reaction to it, right? Because we were so yeah. invested in that campaign. Yes. Yeah. But that's one that I'll remember for sure. Um and then running the Ronin campaign for you guys. That was, that one's kind of been a catalyst for some other things that I'm doing, but um, it was, that's the campaign that was kind of in my head since I was a kid. That's the one that I've always wanted to run. Um, I started it a couple of times with different groups and never finished for whatever reason. Um, either the, the group just didn't have the feel or we didn't have the time or just, it just wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And and I, it's probably a little bit selfish for me to say this, but I wanted to wait for the right group for that one because it that one was 40 years in the making. Yeah. Um, that's the one I daym daydreamed about as a kid. Like I was, I'm very much interested in the feudal Japan's um, history and Bushido and the uh, the Book of Five Rings and that mindset. And um, at times, try to live my life that way or. I shouldn't say at times, pretty much daily, I try to live my life that way. Um, so then to be able to bring that into a game and be that immersed in it and have people who were willing to be that immersed with me made that probably one of my favorite experiences as a GM. Yeah, that game um, was amazing. I, I do have to chime in for that. Like, man, that was like powerhouse emotion through the whole thing. Like there are so many great moments. Like I, I absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm honored that we got to play through that whole thing. Like. Yeah, I still think about that game and, and I kind of miss stepping into like, you know, those wooden sandals of, of those characters because <laughs> I freaking love that game. It was yeah. a great one. I mean, I think now hearing how much it, it meant to you, I don't know that I would have signed up to play for that. I probably, <laughs> probably would have been too intimidating. No pressure, right? Yeah, like, right? Uh, you know, I'm a knuckle dragger, you. right? Like, um, but but I, but I would say in all seriousness, um, in terms of top top games I played in, top five even it, it's probably my one or two i yeah. i mean i gotta tell you you know I, I there have been so many good ones i kind of vacillate but that game was so good and i i, I don't know dennis that um anybody listening to this could ever fully appreciate yeah. the level of sophistication and subtlety that you brought to that game like that world felt so um it just felt so magical a uh, and that isn't even the right wor word, but but just like true to a lot of things that are that are Japanese, like it it just had this subtlety and this nuance that was just so rich and flavorful. I love that world. I had probably my number one moment in playing ever in that game, all thanks to you as a DM, um, which which I want to talk about when we get to right. I'm gonna go scenes. out on a limb and say I think I know which scene that was. <laughs> oh my god. Because that's one like locked in my brain because it was amazing yeah forever um I, i'm gonna guess like we'll, we'll see i'm gonna i'm gonna i, I almost feel like i i need to say a little something about it just mm. to see if i'm right mm. like i'm gonna say it was it was the 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 moment up on the cliff tops that that like battle of a thousand cuts where you never drew your sword well, keep listening because you'll find out in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my prediction because Whether watching right or that, not. right? Watching that was like, oh my god, 
Like, you know, it was one of those moments where it came around to me and I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> Not because like my character sheet was complex, but because I was so wrote to what was happening. It came to me and like, I forgot I was participating. <laughs> <laughs> right, you turned I into was a just like, spectator. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So oh, it was cool. It was I, cool. I'm really glad you brought that up, Dennis, because that, that stands out to me. Probably is one of the best games ever I've ever played in. Um, and of course, you know, hats off to my fellow players too. Like, you know, like Joe brought it, Xander brought it, Chuck brought it. Like in terms of his characters, it it was just such a compelling group of of, of Ronin. And uh, man, I loved it. It was fantastic. Can't say enough good about it. And uh, and your DMing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and honestly, I do want to talk about too, Dennis. Uh, in terms of your your DMing, you do something that I've that I'm trying to emulate in terms of my DM toolbox that I think is just so exceptionally good. And that is, you're very good at giving a party several different tasks. Um, one that stands out from that particular game was I think there were these uh, 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 these witches, maybe, or or uh, some... Oh, some of the Oni. Yes. They, was it the spider, the spider Oni? No, this... Um, this was a scene where sort of climbing up the mountain and they were destroying these shrines and we were under time yes. pressure to keep the shrines from being destroyed. At the same time, it, sort of over on the other side, they were killing innocents. And we, yes. and, and that was all on a timer too. And we had to divide our group, almost be in two places at once. It almost wasn't enough to cover all the bases. Like you're yeah. so good at forcing us to have to cover multiple bases and it just seems like there's never enough time <laughs> or 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 manpower or character power to, to to do that um where did you where did you develop that particular dm tool because it's man it's so gorgeously effective i'm trying to emulate i can't even do it justice um so i'm curious where you got that little that little piece because that's exceptional yeah yeah you know what i'm not 100 percent sure i i don't know if i could give you a real answer on that one um I think it's uh, it comes back to you know knowing kind of what motivates your players and what you, know, you got to hit your players in the fields, right? Yeah. If you want it to be immersive and you want them to be 100% in and have those moments, then it has to has to hit them in the fields. So you know, for Joe, you throw a kid in there in, in peril and nothing else matters, right? Yep. Yeah, I, always. I, I, blinders go on. Like that's <laughs> yeah. that's one of those big things that like you know takes my one little feeling and goes you know dangled over the cliff. Like I I will always run towards that. Yeah, <laughs> and I think a huge heart. <laughs> yeah, and I think some of it comes back to human nature as well. As well, right? It's for the most part we want to help others. That yeah, that's yeah. we're wired to be that way. At least I am, right? Yeah, sure. That's that that mentality, right? So, um, not being able to get everywhere to help everyone hurts yeah. and it's meaningful and it's impactful yep. and you know that's if you can bring those human emotions into your game then i think that makes those games that much better yeah and that's, you certainly that's did kind that. of where i was with that yeah that's, you certainly did that i i got misty eyed uh more than once in that campaign where my <laughs> eyes were just like starting to water up and i'm like be a man joe just tough. <laughs> you're sitting here with all your homies don't break down and cry in front of them but man i tell you like eyes were the tank was filling well i, I would just say to folks, folks who are listening or watching this man pay attention go back and rewind that let's do it again because you're you're basically getting a dm master class here um in, in terms yeah. of how to make impactful games that's outstanding advice man that's really good appreciate that yeah, it seemed like maybe you had another thought on that line, or uh, or uh, did, did, did we wrap up that point? Yeah, if, on the technical side of it, when you you remove the emotion out of it, things in your game need to be meaningful as well. So those shrines, if they were lost, it had impact on the game. Yes, if those innocents were being were lost, that had impact on the game. Yes, if, if I think sometimes we get running in these linear lines and a linear line is easy to overcome. It's point A to point B. But if you put things in the way, emotions and um, targets that you need to fix or, or stop, 
then those it's not a straight line and and then players get out of their character sheets and they start thinking about well this is going to suck if this happens how do i stop it um as opposed to i just need to roll my wisdom and i'm going to beat this right? yep that's it um, that's yeah yeah no that's it those objectives are not throwaway objectives like they have meaning and importantly as you point out they have consequence if we can't cover all the bases if we only rush to one and the shrines fall the world is potentially doomed or at least our our mission just got way harder or if we save the shrines but all these innocents die like there's another huge impact in the world so yeah yeah really great man that's great stuff so I'm curious, maybe is my next question, what what would be your one big piece of of DM advice? Like, what's the what what's the big piece you would have maybe for new or or even experienced uh, DMs out there? My biggest, notes. sorry, I was just whispering. I'm gonna take notes. <laughs> <laughs> gonna write it that, down. That's my Canadian pardon. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I think for me, the biggest thing is find something that you love and run that. If you love Greek history, run that. If you love Old West movies, run an Old West game, right? The more immersed you are into what you are running, I think you'll find the more immersed your players will become as well. Um, that That's just my take. And that a lot of that's from the Ronin game. Um, but you guys, you guys made that Ronin game very easy as well because you were immersed in it and you you wanted to be part of that world, right? Um, yeah. But I think for the Demon Lands, when you ran Demon Lands, Alex, I could tell that you were proud of that world and you were invested in that world. So it made me more immersed in it. Just, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. I and the, that, yeah. the, the pulp culture that was my first ever pulp culture game run i've ever played in that joe ran and he loves that stuff yeah. and you could tell that and you feel that energy coming off the guy running running the game the guy or girl or yeah um, absolutely right and and it's easy it's easier to be drawn in as a player with an energetic dm and i know that's one of the rules in 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 bees um yeah, the, the oath. EGM guide, right? Um, <laughs> the oath. But it, there's so much truth to it. If you run yeah. something, you pick up your book and, okay, I'm going to run this one tonight. And you flip through the pages and you're not invested in it. You're just going through the motions. It's like life, right? You're just going through motions. But if <laughs> if you're invested in, in life, life is pretty good and pretty blessed. Yeah. Right? And your table group will be the same. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you raise an interesting point too. And that's why I feel sorry for those folks who you know, they're just like stuck running modules, you know, they're just like, you know, I must run this module as it's written, <laughs> you know, right. and, they, and they never break outside of that to something that they're passionate about. Right. Like, sit oh tight, my God. Sit tight for a moment, guys. I got to read this box text. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you know, there's something to be said for that type of module. Yeah, yeah. If, you know, it, it's great if you don't have the time yeah, to right. create mm -hmm. something and, um, but even those modules, like our Ronin game, I finished with one of Kelsey's modules. Mm -hmm. Our grand finale was, well, I shouldn't say grand finale. The, the, the finale just before the massive dragon fight yes. um, was her was one of her modules. Yeah, that... So you can take any module and pull it in, regardless of, of what it is or where it comes from, mm -hmm. and put it into part of your game. It's, it's that feeling of, that you need to pull out of that module, not... Not the text mm -hmm. box, or not the stat box, or yeah, right? or or even the genre that it's in, because I yes. mean, it's you can you can reskin anything. Yeah, yep. Uh, hopefully, none of my table players are listening right now, but I'm reskinning Curse of Strahd into a a feudal Japan setting right now. <laughs> oh, nice! Ooh. That is a juicy tidbit. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I love well, hearing that. Um, but Ooh, by the way, that probably shouldn't have told you that because that might have been our next Ronin. Yeah, game. right. Yeah, no, that would have been really good. Well, I got, you have to do something else. Um, I, I got yeah. earmuffs on. I didn't hear it. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very quickly for folks who are listening, I think you're talking about Monastery of the Shadow Sorcerers. Um, yes. That it's Kelsey's adventure. adventure. Folks should go check it out. We didn't realize when we were in it that that's what you had done. Is that you had kind of reskinned or kind of tweaked or uh, borrowed that piece for that kind of almost final uh, temple battle uh, before we before we fought the evil and the dragon and all that. Um, 
But that's it's a great one. That's a great one. Yeah, I, I was just strictly referring to folks who never break out of pre-run modules, right? There are folks who sort of get in that mindset. Like if, you know, some creator out there didn't make it, like, man, folks, run stuff that you're passionate about. Like, that is great advice. For me, Yeah. for me, that means that you're going to run in, like, I should probably be running Alien Predator games, like, literally, like, all the time. <laughs> you know, like, because that is right. definitely a genre that I love. Great. Yeah. yeah. If you want to bring the passion, you know, la passion, mm -hmm. find something you love. That is a, that is a, that's a wonderful tip. That's a yeah. beautiful, great, great, tip. great piece of advice, which is why, you know, this is just so awesome to have folks from our community on, you know, and talk about the hobby and game and get different perspectives. That is great. Um, well, <laughs> right. It's like, how do you follow that? Yeah. Like I, <laughs> Man, that is bringing the big guns this morning. Like just maybe, a knuckle dragger with a daydreamer <laughs> mind, right? Maybe this should be the yeah. ultimate effort show with Dennis. Like <laughs> you can have, right. you can just interview Joe and me sometimes. <laughs> uh, man, great stuff. All right, so we've Ooh. been talking now for about thirty minutes or so. Let's hard to believe time flies. Let's right. move on to talking about character creation and. Ooh. Um, are are we doing it? Are we going there? Oh, is it that time? We're. I think. I think we've reached critical velocity here. Behind the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't keep he quiet. <laughs> can't. He can't. He can't do it with a straight face. Everyone, it's. We're we're working on it. We're training every day. Um. <laughs> um. No. So. Um. We're gonna go behind the sheet. We want to talk about, we've been doing a series on character building. So, Dennis, you haven't seen these episodes yet. They haven't released. Um, by the time your episode releases, we will you will have several where we've already talked about building fighters. We've talked about building range characters. Uh, we've talked about building thieves. And this time, um, we want to talk about building a charisma-based character. Yes. Which, funny enough, like kind of spans. Like, it's not a specific thing. The charisma based character can be a mage or a priest or a fighter or a thief, you know, those those classics. Like it's kind of an all encompassing. It it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I want to I want to kind of steer us maybe in some buckets here, because I like mm -hmm. you know, kind of chunking it up for folks, make it easily digestible. Um, I kind of saw four, but you guys feel free to disagree. Like I think classically there's the bard type character who is charisma based. Yes. Uh, two, you kind of had the provoker or even like a swashbuckler type. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, you have a commander based character, which was a whole class in second edition. It's now been removed okay. for master edition, but, but we want to talk about it because you can make sort of that battlefield commander type with a huge presence, right? Yeah. And I think generally you also have like intimidators, which I think also lends itself to like a thief base or an assassin base type character where, you know, you're used to getting information out of people, <laughs> you know, the, the, the tough way. Um, right. So guys, I'm curious, um, going back to sort of that bard based, what, what do you kind of see? What are your thoughts on building a bard and, and what is sort of maybe some of your go-to in terms of your builds? Um, Joe, do you want to kick us off? And then Dennis, we'll hear from you. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like I, it's Bard is still one of my favorite classes. Like, I mean, I, I love the Bard. I love the Bard and, and it's probably not for what you think. Bard in my eyes is it's like a support class. I mean, it's the Bard is not the hero of the show. The Bard is the guy who supports the other heroes and makes them better. He pushes them and, and inspires them to be better heroes to be bigger heroes to do those big hero things the bard is I, I guess like in a band the bard would be the bass or the drums you know he's that that backbone that kind of like guides the tempo and the music and that that's kind of how i see it and so if i was to build a bard if i was to jump into the book here we do actually have a bard class now in in master edition um and and i think like right off the bat I would go with the battle hymn as my starting ability because that's ultimately going to help the characters. It's going to help the rest of my party 
have a better opportunity to have those big giant moments because that battle him, you know, with me or with charisma role, you're providing music and you're reducing your allies, your, your own ally also, uh, but you're reducing <laughs> allies target by two. And that's monumental. If you're in a tough room and it's already like target 14, target 15, boom, you're dropping two off that. And that's your target continuing on yep. because the bard that battle him is providing that extra oomph. Um, I would also pair that starting loot right off the top because I'm, I'm sticking right into the book here. I'd go with that fine instrument. My battle hymns, and this is a great parody. This is a synergy here. The yeah. battle hymns grant each ally a D8 to boost any one role. And so anybody familiar with Altered State uh, with the Surge Die mechanic, that's essentially what you're doing here. Uh, I mean, it's not as powerful as a Surge. Can't reduce armor with it, although I'd probably allow it. Or, or reduce damage or whatever but adding that and, and and this gives it to everybody so your battle him is not only going to reduce the target by two but it's also going to give all your homies you included a d8 that they can add to their uh to their attempts they can add it to their efforts it's those things that elevate the heroes and and put them up on the pedestal because remember the bard's the storyteller the bard wants them to do well because as a bard where does my fame come from? It comes from the stories I tell. It comes from, it comes from the legends that I create. But you can't create those legends without having the, you know, the, the muse, so to speak, or without having those situations. And to get those situations, you want to elevate the rest of the cast, so to speak. Which you, like, uh, That's uh, what I see as the bard. I was just going to say, Joe, just real quick, would you let them add that D8 to a dying timer? I 100% would. Uh, it, I mean, and that's if I'm looking directly, taking them word for word, boost a D8 to boost any one roll. Yeah. And I would 100% let them add it to the Maybe dying timer. Mm -hmm. Me too. Me yeah, too. Because I mean, it feels like it's that, you know, the music is still there. They're dying, but they're like compelled to like, no, I have to get up. Like, <laughs> right. I need to get up the, because the they, song. Yep. <laughs> it's in my yeah. ears. Yeah, it's like, I mean, that's that's my take. Like, I, I love the Bard. Uh, and as a charisma based, being able to do that, you know, using like that musicality, even if you can't sing, do it anyway. I do that all the time. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I, that's why I love the Bard, because you get to uplift all the other heroes. You get to make the heroes better, because mm -hmm. as a storyteller, which the Bard kind of is, uh, your focus is the is the heroes. Yep. And that's awesome. it's a great support class. And and. I'm droning and yammering on and on and on, but uh, I well, love the bard. Okay, yeah, I, <laughs> that's yeah. my take. Yeah, man, awesome. I love, I love it. <laughs> Dennis, what do you think about the the, the bard charisma based character? Any difference? Oh, Joe, keep droning. I, I haven't made too many bards in my my lifetime. So, um, my last bard actually was a goblin that sang '80s power ballads. <laughs> yes, I, I love that's them. right. Yep. And by the end of the night, I could barely speak and needed a lot of water to fix my throat. But <laughs> yeah, um, but I think he had a lot of the same skills that Joe just brought up. And and his whole role was that background um, character to boost everybody up. And, you know, and I, I'm not great with voices when I when I RP. Um, so um, being able to sing power ballads in a silly voice was was good for me. But um, I think you could also look at the bard like, if, as the provoker. Um, if you want to go down that route, mm -hmm. he could be the one pulling the the big bad off off the guy who's down, right? Come fight me instead, right? Use that charisma to instead of charm and bring everybody's spirits up. He's the one poking the bear. Hey, look at me! I'm over here. This is the one you want. While the rest of your party can look after that the one who's down or the one who's injured or, or whatnot. Right. Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of almost like right into that Inigo or Inigo Montoya, like mm -hmm. provoking, you know, yeah. I am Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that's a provoking statement. That's well, that's who, when I think of the provoker class, that's absolutely who I envision is Inigo Montoya. Yep. Like so one row falls right into that too. One million percent. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would just say, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Your Ronin that you had was a bit of a provoker as well, but he was in a quiet, subtle way. He um, yes. he wasn't, at times he was very overt, but you were very subtle in that nuance of 
um, that slight undertone of insult that I'm going to provoke you into doing something, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the, you killed my father speech. It was like, right. mm, no, I'm just going to tap the Suba on my katana and I'm not actually going to draw it. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. I would definitely agree with that. You, you certainly were Alex. And, and that goes back to that scene, which burned into my brain <laughs> you never even drew the blade and you won the fight oh my god <laughs> yeah I, well you know i that came to me that was sort of a i hadn't really you know, i knew kaya was a gifted swordsman but i didn't know that he kind of had that until you put us in that room with all those glass or all those clay jars yeah and, and then my inner like zelda kicked in and <laughs> and but but Kaya was you know right he was far more subtle he would just be like oh yes like you think you can take us take us on Dink. and then he'd you know he'd knock one off the table <laughs> you know yeah. and then then look at the reaction if that didn't get it he like knock another one off right and then after that it just became like a a, a thing with him right he would just kick over the jars right. or he would say the little phrases that would kind of get under people's skin a little bit to because he knew that he could create a duel right like that provoker yeah. class yeah that he he had a really good chance of winning yeah, yeah. and it, it wasn't done out of and correct me if i'm wrong but it wasn't done out of glory and ego it was done out of if i don't do this my fellow party here could be injured or hurt or killed correct oh, yeah yeah and i would just say just as an aside that's generally my take anyway whenever i play any character is i just want to be helpful to my team yeah. Right. It's because it's not about me. And, and I would just say, you know, generally, you know, I it, unlike Joe, I kind of dislike the bard class just a little bit. <laughs> and and it's because through the years, I think I have some bad DM scars where, you know, I've been in games where people have been a little bit attention hogging and kind of over the top with the bard. And I would just say, you know, if. You know, if, if you play the bard, maybe tone it down one notch. <laughs> And and make it less about you hogging the spotlight and more about propping up your teammates or trying to find creative ways to help your teammates. In that case, it's going to be far more of a beloved character at your table, I think. That's just my advice. You may disagree. Uh, if you do, flame me in the comments, um, <laughs> you know, because then we'll make content out of it. So um. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good tip for players in general, right? Yeah. Especially for... Um, guys and gals who aren't as fortunate as we are to have those table groups where you're constantly going in with with new people i think a lot of times you'll find individuals that have these grand backstories and these builds that they've come up with over days or weeks or researched and they become this power at the table that overshadows everything yeah. instead of coming into those tables where I want, with the the mindset that I was, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to make four new friends today. It, a lot of people, I think, come in with that mindset that I'm going to sit down, I'm going to be the best PC at the table. Yeah, right? I'm going to win and the game today. I'm going to win the game today. Yes. And yeah. I don't know, for me, this isn't about winning. This isn't about beating the GM. This isn't about them versus, or us versus GM. It's you know, like, let's make new friends and let's have some fun. Let's roll some dice and make stories that six years down the road, we're still, we still remember That's it. Yeah. or be in a game where two dudes want to invite you in to talk about on a podcast. Right. Like that's, that's what this <laughs> yep. is about. For me. Yep. Right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that bard character just, you know, the restate, I guess, with, with all that is his gift isn't taking the spotlight. It's redirecting the spotlight. Yes. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yep. That's that's my yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and I but I would just say because um because I want to get to provoker here a little bit. Yep. I was um, just gonna bring that up. Where where's yours go? Yeah. Just to wrap up this bard piece, I I agree with you. I think I'd run. I'd build one straight on a master edition. I would definitely do battle him. I would definitely do prestige. I would definitely do the fine instrument. But what I would do is I would steal the green staff from the priest yes so the green staff is great you know you get three wisdom spells instantly so i would have those in my instrument like i would 
I would make I would apply the green staff abilities to my fine instrument like a tag. So yeah. I could generate these spells a little bit like Scanlan and Vox Machina. Like I would have some of these go-to spells like Illusion or, you know, you have the hand that lifts you up. Like I would have some of that fun support type stuff. Scanlan's hand! <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then the, the thing about it, you know, the green staff, if it's lost, it comically turns up in 1d4 rounds. What a great tag or ability to apply to your fine instrument, right? Like, yeah. You know, like it falls off a cliff or whatever, and then suddenly it's back in your pack. You know, uh, I, I would definitely add that piece probably if I were to make a if I were to make a bard. Yes. Um. Dennis, and what about the? Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Dennis. Any any other thoughts on Provoker in terms of would you build it straight out of the Master Edition out of the book? Would you go with the Provoker ability and then the the heirloom weapon and those sorts of things? I don't know. I, you know, you bring up a very good point too um, by bringing in the green staff. I think it's important to as players and GMs to be open to things like what you just said because how creative is that? You lose your loot, and three rounds later, two birds are fighting over it around the corner, right? Right. Um, I, 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 you know what? I would if I was to build a provoker, I'd probably sit down, go through all the book, come up with an idea in my head that I. I think would fit with the group and then run it by everybody. Um, mm -hmm. well, to be honest, most of the characters I make with you guys, I just randomly roll. So it's, it's, it's quite <laughs> tough for me to sit down and go, well, this is what I'm going to build. I got you. Um, very, every now and then I have a theme, like the archer we have in Joe's high level game. I've always wanted to make a powerful arcane archer mm -hmm. and that's, he's, he's a druid. That's a rad now, character. Right? So, um, so that was a theme, but, yeah, honestly, most of the time I just randomly roll my stats in my class and off we go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I also, I do want to point out again, like I, I love doing that reskin of other abilities to build the character you want. Uh, but just for the purposes of our thing, you know, I, I, I take the, I'm playing the role of the fresh and new guy that just got this. So I'm looking, you know, right from the mm -hmm. book, yep. the easy peasy. Uh -huh. um, but but I do, I and have frequently reskin stuff and i love doing that and i gotta say that that elemental archer is uh a really rad character like, yeah yep. that, that's a great really one good. those the way you skinned everything together is it's so much fun to watch <laughs> well it's joe fun to play right and it's i think it's fun to play as a as, we're getting off topic here sorry nope, I, I tend to fine. ramble no nope, um, you're fine if you have something in mind for your character uh you're not really changing mechanics if you change what it looks like if you pull a skill or a starting loop from somewhere else, right? Um, and I know there's a lot of this. Yeah, there's a lot of times we run into GMs and players that say, if, if it's not rules as written, it's not allowed, regardless of what you're playing, ICRPG to 5e to Legend of the Five Rings or whatever. Um, you know, play the character that inspires you and inspires your table. Yeah, that, that means... Right? your your loot is a green staff loot then it's a green staff loot because right. yeah. the uh, rules is written this is why i have to say the rules is written we're just going to reach over and we're going to take that page <laughs> right out of the book oh my god was that your leather bell master <laughs> your clippers <laughs> no way Man, I, I keep a notebook on the side over here that was just a blank page it was scary though wasn't it yeah it was <laughs> like what are you doing you crazy person <laughs> <laughs> that's great well hey you know on this provoker thing i i totally would build it right out of the book like like joe uh, take the provoker ability hurl the insults get them to to duel you just like dennis pointed out i think that's a beautiful use of that ability like yeah. no like come fight me um mm -hmm. air, heirloom weapon i would definitely do that the best synergy right there is if you take the nemesis milestone because yes. Once your nemesis is killed, that person that you're taunting, you instantly heal to full hit points. Um, you know, if you kill your nemesis. So that's epic. And then honestly, the only other thing I would add to that is I would go to Path of I would go to Path of Iron in the paths, Ooh. and I would take yeah. Kit of Spikes. So even if you're missing, or even if they miss you, like you're you're still dealing 1d4 damage. So I imagine Nigo Montoya, right? Like you do that flurry of exchanges and you, you still catch him on a cheek. 
right? <laughs> you know, and they take a little bit of damage, you know, so. Right. That's a hundred percent, like totally a Zoro move too. That's the, yep. <laughs> and now you got this little Z and it's like, right. And, and so again, it's reskinned. It's less about that spiky armor, you know, you might see in a fighter, you know, like your Thwibbledorf Quint kind of guys, right? It's less about that. It's more about your blade and, you know, that swashbuckling kind of thing. So, right. and it doesn't even have to be a blade, uh, vulgar. I had those gauntlets. Exactly. And we skinned that with him kind of as that brawler. When people would miss me, he'd get in a quick little jab. <laughs> yep. Ah! yep, exactly. You know, that's that's we skinned it that way. It was, you know, lots of ways to play it. Absolutely. But that's, that's great for a provoker. Yep. How about the commander class? Which this is a, this is a fun topic because when Dennis and I first played our lizard men, that's who Slass was. I, mm-hmm. I built him high charisma. And he kind of kind of banged his spear on his shield, his wooden shield, to kind of evoke fear or um, or rally people to his cause. So, Joe, how would you go about commander? Man, yeah, for a commander, seeing as I mean, I, my my second edition book is back over here. Wow, I'm getting really good at pointing these out. God, I'm like, man, lear- I'm learning that mirror image. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be like, hey, like you know, look at this alien behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't match it up in space. Right. Man, you know, I, I think uh if I was to build a commander, you know, with, with our current uh with, with the current um what's it called? Uh oh, brain fart, uh master edition, mm-hmm. you know, I I would kind of start looking uh man, I would have to like I would have to like pick and choose to pull other to pull other things out. Yeah. Um, to, to really get that to, to go. And I, I think I would, I would probably talk with my, my game master to see if, uh, and it's, I'm looking at the bard page, uh, mm-hmm. to see if I could take a milestone ability as my starting ability. And, and I would look at, uh, I would look at blood and thunder, Oh, nice. you know, to kind of go that way where blood and thunder with a charisma role, I can grant one ally, a critical hit on their next role. Yep. It's just an auto crit, like things like that, where, you know, I mean, I know that's like mechanically and a little, maybe a little more combat focused, but I would look at going something more that road where you can be like, you know, uh, you're yelling across the battlefield. You're there, you plant your blade, you know, and you're looking across and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I guess in that sense, you know, uh, I was, you know, it would be in that sense of like, you know, Dennis, there's an opening. He's focused on me. Get in there. Hit yep. him from the side. You know, like, you're you're sending those messages across the battlefield. You're giving them that opportunity to come in, and you know they're going to get a critical hit because that kind of commanding presence. And and I know there's there's other abilities like if I if I looked a, look through a little bit more that could definitely be pulled to give that commander thing. Yes. You know, um, I, I man, I got to step outside of the book. I, I would also say maybe maybe I'd look at something along the lines of uh, you know maybe even close to like that fine instrument boost of that D eight or um, gosh, mm-hmm. I want to say there's a spell or something somewhere that, uh, cause I, I know somebody's just used it in some of our games. I, I think there's a, there's one somewhere that lets you give somebody a hero coin mm-hmm. that generates one, things like that, like that commanding yes. presence to, you know, again, kind of to uplift, you know, but commander is still going to be a, you know, battle hardened. Like I see them still being able to hold their own, but almost in that like like they're split like they're they're doing like their focus stuff but then they're also uplifting and supporting the rest of the party gotcha you know, in that commander sense like I, I think i would look at things like that like that that blood and thunder thing i would check for that or i would ask about that uh i can't even remember what it's called i don't have time to find it yeah that's okay but i, I think it might be a spell or something that, mm-hmm. that lets you grant another character a hero coin like, correct of, of your own volition and and i think things like that 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 you can spend just with some rp you know it kind of focuses rp uh to kind of display that commanding presence um mm-hmm. awesome you know, you can, yeah that's 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 my thought for that is like do things to support that to give them those openings those opportunities dennis you got any thoughts on the commander build Mine would be a lot like Joe, I think. I think spells like Lionheart, um, mm-hmm. Defender tag for the fighter. Yes. Things where you put yourself in danger and you protect others. Um, 
to me as a commander, you're, you are the forefront. You're, you're the pointy end. I'm going to stand here. You guys here, you, you know, swap my turn for, for your turn, things like that. Um, and then the other side of it, look at things that cause fear in the enemies as well, right? As you're propping up your side, you're demoralizing the other, you're, you're that disruption as well, right? Yes. Radiant shield spell that affects all the evil around you, things like that. That's nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like you're, I, I see um, off the top of my head, a commander, I see that guy in that knight in shining armor or that bulwark of of the army that's standing there and yeah when when someone goes down he's got the ability to pick them back up and give them a little bit of healing and stand them on their feet pat them on the back and say it's going to be all right (laughs) yes and then shove them towards the the bad guy right so Uh, you, you brought up an interesting point that that's there's definitely an ability there that i would love to skin around uh giving up your turn for another character that's some commander-esque stuff where your turn is you know push forward and you give your action and your turn to another character even if they've already had their go or they've got their go coming up later that is a beautiful beautiful element right there Mm -hmm. there's one action is them getting the action tactician roll your intelligence or charisma to exchange your turn with another player oh beautiful. (laughs) beautiful beautiful yep yeah and i would just say just to cap this off i would definitely i might you know to, to do commander i might go thespian and reverse yeah, cloak and make it less about fids and more about these commanding statements that kind of rally my teammates um i would probably go in that in that direction uh, again with a lot of points and charisma and then i i just got to point out guys because it you know it's still here like in second edition, there's a whole commander class. Yes. And everything in this commander class is like super tasty. So like the Amulet of the Kings plus five charisma when commanding the blazing hilt stone where like suddenly you have a fire weapon. Like how awesome is that when you're just like, you know, come at me, you know, or I will protect you all, which I think is commander type deal. The lion breastplate, like, plus three charisma when you're being frightened or intimidated. The um, the Lazarus ring, 1d8 when you're dying rather than normal dying timer. Yep. Because, you know, the commander just doesn't go down in the thick of battle, right? <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. The Titans battle cry, grant plus three to all allies next attempts or minus three to all enemies next attempts. That's one of the most powerful abilities out there um, yeah. because you can influence an enemy's role. Like yeah. you, you almost never see that nice RPG. So that's pretty epic. That's page thirty six in uh, in second edition in the core. So I hi- highly recommend folks check that out if they're considering that build. Yeah, yeah, Ooh. great points. Yeah, yeah, and that's a that's a hefty nugget. You know, enemy rolls are now hard. I mean, that's the minus three. That's our our locked in easy hard language. Yep. Yes. Allies are easy or enemies are hard. Yep. Like that's. Beefy. <laughs> yeah, beefy. So what about uh what about an intimidator class? Like you're you know, you're playing that guy with maybe like the burnt, the scarred face or whatever, and they just you know you're playing that huge hulk and they just intimidate people by their sheer presence. Again, totally charisma based. Like maybe you're an assassin, maybe you're um you know, just like a huge giant of a person and you just scare people. What what do you think, Dennis? What do you got? On that. You're starting me off on that one, are you? Uh-huh. Um, I'd be going for things like the milestone abil- abilities in the Bard for like Dirge of Fear. Sorry, I got my book out here. I'm, I'm looking down. Um, yep. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're, you're good. good. Uh, to the pain, like things that are going to, if you want to fully buy into that trope, yes. things that are going to cause fear um, for your um, for your enemies to run away. Um, I think the Slayer tag would be a good one too. Because you want to hit the hit them hard, right? So yeah. That that one that blow that you hit them with, combined with that fear of those other abilities. Yes. You you want to make that intimidator that they don't want to fight you, uh, and epic. if they try, you hit them once and they're changing their mind already, right? Epic. Right? Yes, that's exactly. I, that's almost exactly how I build that character. That's money. Right. Joe, right. what do you got? 
Yeah, you know, funny enough, I was also also looking at, you know, things like to the pain, because I mean, that flat out sends people mm -hmm. potentially running in fear. Um, and, and also, you know, potentially even um, looking at those fighter tags, that pit fighter, I mean, that one could be also kind of a tasty intimidator Ooh. in that same sense of mm -hmm. like Slayer, where they just hit you, you take some damage, and in kind of a very aggressive display of intimidation, you hit them back harder. Yes. You know, kind of a thing. Like, it, it could very easily be skinned that way with a, a charisma fighter build. Yes. Like, man, like, I, I don't know how much I actually have to add to that because, uh, Dennis, I think you kind of, like, yeah, yeah, I ailed that intimidator. The only other thing I would say in terms of the milestone abilities on that bard page is I might choose the prestige. Mm -hmm. So roll charisma to create realistic effects such as teleportation, you know, theatrical illusions that baffle and convince. I might even add that to like my flourishes with my blade or whatever. Y you know what I mean? Like, uh, like that sort of stuff. Um, or even if it's just like, oh my God, there are two of them. <laughs> like with the, with like the, the self cloning <laughs> thing or, oh my God, how did he move so fast? Like I would maybe kind of reskin some of the prestige and use that as a way to, to, to be sort of that intimidator charisma based class. So, right. You know, you could potentially even go over uh, out of, out of uh, warp shell. The navigator class has the, the loot, the boost helmet, you know, it focuses your will and you can use any stat as strength. So as a high charisma character, if you wanted to be intimidating, you know, you could almost imagine you've got, you know, like your plus four, plus five charisma, and you just give something like a hoist to like this, this thing that's maybe stronger. Like you, you could be a scrawny guy, like, you know, a little goblin and using that intimidator as they just hoist some stone. This is what you now face kind of a thing. <laughs> right. You know, or something like that. Like there's other ways you could kind of spin that, uh, that intimidation. And I, I think a boost helmet reskinned yeah. is, you know, like a, some type of amulet of, you know, or something or a ring or, or who, who knows some other piece of loot or even take it straight as an ability, like yeah. things like that, that, uh, I mean, that, that could be fun. Oh, that's more of a very physical intimidation. Yeah, but that's awesome. I mean, you go completely opposite, too, and go down the shadow assassin path. Target doesn't yeah. know there, know you're there. It can't miss. You add that to, to the pain. How intimidating would it be if a shadow came out? <laughs> right. Hammered you and then that's, faded away. Right? That's tasty, right? Or, right? or I might even add, like, like, I might even take the prestige as, like, a mage, you know, and do the whole, you know, Bilbo Baggins, I'm not trying to rob you. You know, right. and the lights. Do not take me as a conjurer of cheap tricks. Right. And the lights dim, and yeah, you know that sort of thing. Like that would be epic. That that sort right. of minor illusion cantrip, so to speak. So, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. Good work, the guys. Don will take you all. <laughs> yeah. I think the the common theme in all of that though is just be creative. Yes. Get outside the book, get outside the lines that are in here and use your imagination. That's Be it. Be creative. That's it. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and that's been yeah. sort of our hope in sort of showcasing some of this and kind of jumping around is, is to show people like, look, you can make a ton of cool characters just what's written there, but you, man, you have this whole universe of stuff. And from my standpoint, as a DM, if, if a player wants to take a milestone, like if it's milestone time, the whole buffet is available, you know, within reason. Yeah. Like if there's some one that's a little bit weird, like we might talk about it, but pretty much like all those loot tables, all those milestones, mix, match, yep. grab cool stuff, create a cool synergy that somebody didn't think about and and make just the character that you're that you're thinking about. So all right, everybody. Man, we have exhausted talking about charisma based builds, I think. Uh, or at least we've given you some inspiration to kind of create uh your uh your own type of character uh if you come up with something different let us know down in the comments we definitely want to talk about or email us by the way haven't been doing a good job joe of letting people know ultimate ultimate effort show at gmail.com please email us uh let us yep. know your burning thoughts your questions um provide some of those cool character builds if you have different ideas uh, we'll be glad to mention them on the show yeah we'd, we'd love to hear about them or read about them you know yes any way you can get in touch with us yeah absolutely Facebook group, Discord, private messages, or like Alex said, write in the comments or through the email, ultimate effort show at gmail.com. Yep, hit us up. Um, but I guys, I think it's time that we go 
behind the screen. <laughs> All right, so today's topic is we want to talk about, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions um, in terms of like starting a campaign uh, about having to build a whole giant world from scratch. And, and I think people feel that pressure like, oh my God, I've got to build a world, you know? And I think what I would say to that is, like, have you ever tried to build a whole world? Like, like good luck. Like, I don't think... Like I don't, I couldn't build a gymnasium, <laughs> you know, right? Like I couldn't, I couldn't build a room on my own necessarily, right? So taking on this task as a DM uh, of building a whole world, although I know people love to start there, like what does my world look like? In a way, to me, almost feels like a fool's errand, and maybe you guys disagree, um, but it almost feels like a fool's errand before you start a campaign to go, I'm going to build this whole world. Like, oh my God, like that is, do you know how big the world is? Like, that's big. Um, but I'd be curious to hear from you what you guys think about that. Because the best advice that I think I would give folks is let's focus first on the micro. Like, instead mm -hmm. of thinking so globally, let's take it down. Like, let's build one discrete space first. Like, let's build one encounter Right. And then let's see if we can chain some encounters together and then maybe flesh out the world from there. That that would be probably hands down like my advice. But but I would just be curious, um, Joe and Dennis, like, what do you guys think about that topic? Uh, wh where do you sort of land? And I think I think I'm also I'm very, very, very close to right where you're at. I mean, uh, in, in the current council game. I, I know very little of this world. You know, is this this game, this system, everything's being built? I really don't know a whole lot about it at all. So I'm I'm looking very micro, you know. I know we have a town. I know there's a volcano that just erupted and is coating the sky in blackness. I know there's a vampire lord lord to the south. Those are the things I know about this world. So it's it's that uh that small kind of micro kind of feeling you know what i mean like these are the points i know i've got these these three things mm -hmm. lined up and that's my building point i know i know there's a town and i know there's other elements coming in so i'm literally designing and thinking about this world from just those very small points uh and it it, it does help for keeping your focus and not having to stress about well what's across the ocean because we're right. pretty, we're fairly close to a coast what's all the way to the you know the other direction what happens over there what's going on 200 miles south i don't care about any of that we're not there yeah, right. that's not important <laughs> until we get there like right like the immediate focus the entire world right now is this town our town that the players are in uh the woods to the south uh where things are starting to creep through um the threat from the north, which we had kind of just, you know, finished up this this element that has like blocked out the sun with all of this soot and smoke in the sky. This is the entire world at this moment. So I, I definitely agree with like that starting small, you know, um, uh, it's the same thing I would do if I was building from scratch. If we were just starting a fresh brand new campaign, uh, I would start in that very similar way. Like, I, I mean, also, I would like to start right in the middle of action. So I might not start with a town. The first thing I build about this entire world might be this, you know, this space. Like, you wake up in a cage. There are <laughs> there are two ghoulish-looking things dragging a body away, and you watch them <laughs> throw him over the thing. The that is our entire world. world right now. Yeah, right. That is like, the world. Yeah, it's you, a very pressing, a, very yeah. pressing one in that moment. <laughs> right. You you walk into a town, and there's a there's this child tied up to a post and they are getting ready to burn her like that is the whole world like everything else happening outside can be built as you go as you explore that like uh, that that's my take like start in those those small discrete spaces that you can you know um kind of tune and dial and control those pressures you know yes. you're you're not like cooking for an entire catering business you know you're you're just you're just cooking this one little meal for dinner tonight right <laughs> right. Right. I'm cooking for five. I'm not cooking for 300. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dennis, what's your, what's your take on that topic? I'm pretty much like Joe. Um, I've always been of the mind where you, 
you daydream big, but you start small, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, love that me, sound bite. Yeah. Um, I love it. It's for me, I need to know what my, who my, my evil entity is. I'd like to know what they, what their motivation is. Essentially. I don't have to have it all fleshed out. I just need to know that this person is, there's a cult bringing this person back or, um, the, I don't know, the evil space alien group is stealing warp baby warp shells, um, right from our, our, our <laughs> Mecha Titanfall game, right? Yep. Yeah. Right. There needs to be what is the big picture, what's happening, but let's start right here and hook the players into this little area that they are um, tied to, that there's meaning in this village or there's meaning with your the, the unit of Mecha that you're with. These are your, your co-pilots or whatever, right? Yeah. Start small and then, but know what the big, the big theme is and then the other side of that would be a lot of players like to have backgrounds for their characters either randomly rolled or one liner or whatever know what those are and how you can get them in the fields again with those as you go through where where is that going to fit yeah. as you play through your campaign to to like how does joe not having you know the the bones falling through joe's character's hands in his nightmare how will those fit into the story? Mm -hmm. And you might not know in the beginning, but That's just it. have that. Those are those five bullet five bullet points. Okay, Joe has this, Alex has this, Xander has this. Right. And then when you get to that that day, when you're you're <laughs> looking at pictures or maps or whatever, and you're like, this is perfect. And you yeah, put a little check mark beside that. And then Joe is welling up in your game. Yep. And plug it in. Yep. Exactly. Yep. I yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think that's really good advice. And I guess maybe the best analogy that I could come up with to maybe put this in concrete terms is like, let's think about the Death Star for a minute, right? Like we know somewhere on the Death Star, like we've, we've, we've dreamed big. There's a space station as big as a small moon, right? We know somewhere on that thing is an evil emperor that can shoot electricity. We've maybe we've kind of envisioned that final battle in the throne room, right? With lightsabers and arcing electricity but but we're at the stage where we don't have to build the whole death star you know the death star has what you know like 300 levels and each one of those is divided by you know 50 you know it, it, like it probably has like over twenty thousand rooms yeah in the it, minimum in the death star like you're not gonna pull out your notebook and go okay well i gotta get to twenty two thousand room one cafeteria <laughs> Room, <laughs> the trash compactor. Room, right, room two, right. Yeah. In terms of critical scenes for a night of play, like, we know that there's a hangar. Like, maybe we have envisioned, okay, there's a hangar. Okay, that play, that's probably a battle map, but that place is cool, right? We know there's a corridor with a lift, right? We got to get to, sneak to. We know mm -hmm. that there's a detention level, right? Where we're going to have to rescue a princess and maybe bluff or shoot our way in. Probably going to be more like shooting if you fail a charisma roll. <laughs> we're, we're all fine here. How about you? Um, right. We know that there's going to be a trash compactor. There's going to be a trap. We mm -hmm. know some at some point after that, there's going to be a bridge we're going to have to jump across or get across or swing across. We know, you know that maybe there's a shield generator we're going to have to go after. And we know ultimately we're going to have to escape in a ship back in a hangar. Oh, there's probably a big corridor where we're going to end up in a big gun battle with a bunch of enemies pouring in at us right and that'd be a great place to put right above the trash compactor yeah exactly so <laughs> there are in that framework i've maybe described six or seven rooms mm -hmm. right for the first night of play we only want to focus on three of those but we're going to focus on getting out of the hangar sneaking to the lift and you know what's going to happen and maybe the finale for the night of play is oh crap we're in the trash <laughs> compactor Right, right. That's that final frame. You've you've worked your way and fought through that <laughs> that third space of the detention level, and you've escaped into the trash compactor. Yeah. What's your final frame? Three PO, shut down the trash compactor <laughs> on the detention them, level. Shut them all down, and from the DM standpoint, the realization that like, oh, there's something just brushed past my leg in the murky water. <laughs> yeah. Right? right. Like that's right. your cliffhanger. But look how small those spaces are. Right. Like we and don't. That's have... a whole Death Star right now. Yeah. Like. Talking about building a world, we haven't even built a whole, you know, small moon. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> like, like we only need to build enough of the world, those three discrete places for that night of play, and everything else is sort of implied. Like, it's implied that there are things bigger than you that are out there. Hey, we don't have to... Like, Tatooine awaits... Hoth awaits, Dagobah awaits, we'll get there eventually, but I don't have to plan all that. Because to Joe's point, like, what's across the sea? Well, we don't need to know yet, and if you take the time planning all that, there's a huge chance that your players will never even see that. And and you've yep. just done a ton of work. You know, if you're a busy DM like I am, you've just done a t- ton of work that may not ever make it into your game. Right. And it's also divided your focus away from the immediate you know, if you're, you're busy planning, you know, 6,000 miles away, what's on this, you know, what other coast is across the sea, you're focusing everything there instead of focusing on what's in the woods directly to the south where these new threats are coming from. Like, should be thinking of that, like, what's the, you know, like, like Dennis had said, what are, what's the more direct character driven impact that's happening right here and right now? It's not across the sea on that other coast unless that's the direction where your big threat is coming from it's it's not important and even then like i wouldn't even look at across the sea i would look at what's on the beach right now because a ship just landed right. rowboats are coming in like right on the coast yes you know 20 miles outside of town like instead of across the coast like that's yeah that's beautiful yeah exactly that because that... oh and to another thing i'm sorry to touch yeah. on yeah. on a point you you had about the death star you know, this built a whole Death Star with just these three starting rooms, three, four starting rooms. There's the illusion, there's that knowledge that it's a much bigger and thriving place because as you're sneaking into the detention level, there are troops and regular uniformed officers and such walking around on their daily tasks. They are going other places (laughs) that you're hiding, you're trying to hide from them to sneak in. You know there's other things happening because where'd those stormtroopers just walk to? Well, that little droid came searching around from somewhere. Those guys in uniforms, those officers are walking through with their checkboard and, you know, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm on my way right now. Like you're getting those little snips. So like the characters can see that it is a much bigger place. And it, <laughs> yeah. it feels like a full world and you're only doing three rooms because <laughs> that's the whole world. <laughs> like stuff is happening in the hallway yeah like should yeah. we should we put these on <laughs> yeah, you know like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that kind of stuff right and and so yes and then that sort of leads to the other point is you know if you're looking at these small spaces and typically what i do is i will like go okay the first encounter is we got to sneak to the lift past this busy hallway where all these people like that's the first encounter make it to the lift undetected right yeah how do you get there how do you get oh, there there's stormtroopers walking up to see what's on this ship because you just got pulled in by a tractor beam that's the start of our scene you're yep. hiding in the ship it, exactly how are you getting out exactly in in a place as big as the death star there might be other corridors that you have to pass are we going to spend time dealing with all of those passageways like am i going to plan out you know two football fields worth of corridors to get to the lift. Right. right. I can tell you my answer. My answer is no. Right. Like, like I'm skipping that mundane stuff and focusing where the action is. I mean, Joe, you're right. That first piece of action is the ramp of the, you know, the ramp of the millennium Falcon in the bed, yeah. you know, like TK four, two, six, why aren't you at your post? Like that kind of stuff. And then the other right. piece is that something wrong with my comms? Yes, just enough <laughs> of the hallway that leads to the lift at the at the end of it. Like that's the critical piece. Like, whew, we've almost gotten away with it, mm-hmm. but now we have to make it past this, you know, this procession of guards. Dennis, do you agree? I do. Yeah i I tend to shorten the travel in my games for sure. If if I need to make the travel meaningful, that's where I drop in um, like a skills test where if you make too many failures, then there's a, um, like there'll be a fight or there'll be a scene that you have to deal with. And I used a bunch of those in Ronin as well. Um, yes. Like, like it become travel is a scene. If it's, if it's, you know, if it's meaningful. Yeah. Yes. But if it's not meaningful, then I, I remove it. Yep. Um, and I know there's people that love to do the whole dungeon crawl and go five feet at a time with a 10 foot pole. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I'm just not one of them, right? I, I'm, I'm too, you know, maybe I'm ADD or ADHD or just antsy in general. I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, I, I find the less immersed, immersive our scenes are and immersive our game is, the less immersed our players are. And if you can keep them tied up and and focused, and if, if that means removing those long, okay, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to do every eight hours, you need to roll me a die on this chart to see if anybody comes along, right? Um, so I would much rather condense that into, we're going to go around the table once. If you get three failures, then something will find you, right? right? Super simple. We have it done in a minute and we carry on and there's still that tension. Yeah. Somebody comes close, you hear the roar in the trees or the, the cracking of bushes, but yeah. uh, you're able to hide your party or or whatever it is. You're able to find the path that doesn't make noise or however you want to phrase that. But um, for the most part, I'm very much a, let's, let's get rid of all the extra. Yeah. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. But, I, was, I was just going to say, I was once in a game where we had to get across the surface of Mars. Now, if you've, if you've seen any recent footage of the surface of Mars, <laughs> you know what a barren, desolate landscape that is. And I am not even kidding you. Like, we did probably 20 hours of travel across the surface of Mars, and we rolled, like, monotonously for every hour. And the crazy part is we never even hit a single encounter on our way there. Oh. And I'm telling you, like, we spent 30 minutes plus like just sitting there doing nothing. And I would just say, folks, like, please don't do that to your players. That right? that had to be the most excruciating 30 plus minutes, like almost ever in a game. Right. You know, and, and, and things like that, you could take take a cue right from real life. You're taking a trip to Yosemite. Was the exciting part that you're telling your buddies about after the fact? What were you talking about the you know nine hour drive? To get to Yosemite, or were you talking about Yosemite? Did you say, "Yeah, we drove there, and when we got there, this happened, then right. this happened"? You didn't right. like go into detail of like, so we were on the road, right? <laughs> right. And we're doing about sixty-five, seventy, and you know, we we got like a couple miles down the road, and then there was some traffic in the first hour. Past yeah. <laughs> now let me tell you about the second hour. hour. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. The the only thing you're telling about on that trip is, you know, if we stopped at this gas station. And we got out and man, there was this crazy stuff happening. Like this dude came flying out the door and some other dude like wham. And then this car crashed. Like you're talking about the exciting moments on that stop, mm -hmm. that encounter you had at the gas station. You're not talking about every single fill up. You're talking yeah. about the exciting ones. You're focusing like those same things on those road trips, on those things. Like, sure, you might've had fun on the travel, but you know what? You summed that up when you said, yeah, we sang some songs and listened to some cool music as we drove up to Yosemite. And when we got there right out the tunnel, we had to pull the car over for the scenic overlook. And then we saw some deer over, like you went to the big points. Like, you know what I mean? Like you skipped the travel. Kind of just narrate right through the travel. Like you don't have to play every grueling step and how much basil you put in the stew when you made camp. Like, unless there's an encounter there like what's the point of describing the whole travel like or like that's the table lights right know your players that's, that's true if your players like those two hours of rolling then i can't be your dm personally i'm sorry but <laughs> yeah. um but there's dms out there that love that right then well yes so yeah, find that's the players the, that's that, the best point there about find that. the players that fill your bucket yeah that's right that's right um let me say i think maybe for our podcast right now one of the reasons why I tend to disfavor that method, um, and I'm not bagging on anybody's game. If you love to play that way, man, play that way. But one of the reasons why I mention that is because uh, we're trying to give advice that can help people get up and running quickly in terms of running games and potentially running fulfilling, exciting, meaningful games where players walk away and go, oh my God, that was an amazing game. And the reason why I think we're steering folks towards this method to really look at discrete spaces is because when you focus on those mundane things, as we've talked about, the downside is you, you, you tend to have problems with immersion. You tend to have problems with players checking out and checking their phones. Uh, you tend to have uh, problems with group cohesion. 
and, and then you end up with like people tend to start to create their own fun. Like the first NPC they run into, they want to murder. And it's just like, why did you murder that person? Well, you didn't give us you didn't give us anything else to 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 deal with in, in that time. We have all these abilities on our sheet. We didn't get to use any of them. So to avoid a lot of those problems that I think plague some DMs, like, you know, my game just all my players seem checked out. Well, did you thrust them into something exciting? Or were you right. sitting there just rolling monotonously for an hour? Right? Right. So I I would just say if you like that style of play, if that's what your group prefers, a very slow kind of build, then play that way. But for for newer DMs and for folks um who maybe been in this a while and who want to have it, keep that excitement and, and keep that their level of their games and the immersion high and keep it super fulfilling. These are the behaviors that we would prescribe, you know, kind of like going to the doctor, right? <laughs> you know, like here's a prescription to kind of help your game. It isn't, this isn't a cure-all for everything, but here's a way that that maybe your game can be just a little bit more better, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely, I also want to reiterate that. Like I'm not saying you're playing wrong or anything like that. If you enjoy those, you know, the travel moments and things like that. That is a great point, guys. Thanks for thanks for humbling me here and giving me a little schooling. No. But yes, mo most certainly, like uh, um, like Dennis said and like Alex said, you know, that's that's not my cup of tea. But if if uh, if that is the type of game you like, if if you want to play that slower thing, if you want to cover all the travel, the moments in town through the shopping, like I love you for it. Like do that if that's what you and your group are having fun doing, then. 100% dive all in on that. Mm -hmm. But I, but I would think too, you know, there's there there are a lot of bad habits in the hobby, right that we picked up you know over time. And I would just say this is probably a more modern approach. Like we've made it sort of clear Joe in our intro video that we wanted to have sort of a more modern approach to gaming. I think this yeah. is it. Like I think that sort of play is maybe a habit of yesteryear almost that we're just going to roll and roll and roll and roll and the players just don't do anything for a while. Right. Like I think we're prescribing something that's a bit more modern. Like, Hey, we want to propel people into action and propel people into events, you know? Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, heck just, just uh, earlier this week, uh, Thursday night in our game started off in a tavern. It had been three weeks or so since the last thing. And uh, I, I still think personally, I think I maybe stretched it a little too long, but I, I went in and it was just that little bit of exposition. There was kind of a town meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I gave everybody, you know, I went through just one round. Is there anything you guys want to add to this? You know, and, and that was it. Like it was just one, one turn for each person. As it came back to Farmer Grimly running in, you know, my livestock is being killed. And I know it's not the wolves because I just found their mangled bodies on the old road to the deep wood south of my farm. So I know it's not the wolves that are killing my livestock. Something else is doing it. And that was kind of like that hook and that push where the mayor turned around and, oh, well, you saved so many people, the heroes, you know, up north, you know, with, with the other ailment, previous adventures. Like, w will you guys check it out? Because they'd already trusted and known that, of course, the heroes are the heroes. But so, so there was like that, that short exposition. It could have been a much longer scene, you know, if more of the RP was what we were looking for. But it was, I still well, personally think I, I took too long, nope. but it was like that, well, that little exposition and push to get into. Well, and then the, the, the very next discrete space was us in the woods with, with the evil closing in. Like yeah, we, we didn't right talk about, edge. we didn't talk about the, you know, the half mile trek mm -hmm. to, to that point where the livestock and the mangled wolves bodies were found. Like we didn't talk mm -hmm. about, we skipped all that and got yep. straight to that moment at the edge of the woods with the darkness and the eyes peering out at us. And, and, and then eventually we were, you know, we were at, at something exciting, something worthwhile. Yep. Yep. You know, that was our, that was our gas station stop where something exciting happened. Well, I, you know, I, I just tend to think of it, you know, in, in terms of the way we consume fiction, right. You know, like if you, if you think I use an example before, if we think about Buffy, the vampire slayer, right. We, we don't watch you know, in terms of watching the show, we don't watch Buffy, like, take a shower, get ready, like, brush her teeth, like, go grab a banana for breakfast, make a smoothie, you know? Like, we, we don't watch her, like, do her homework. You know, we pick up at the moment, and we don't even watch Buffy necessarily even, we might get a glimpse, but we don't necessarily watch Buffy pack her, her, her 
a messenger bag full of steaks. We don't watch her get on her bike and ride to the park. We pick up in the show at the moment where Buffy arrives at the edge of the park and she hears somebody scream and there are two vamps like assaulting some girl, right? Like that's the moment that's exciting for us. And that's the moment where we pick up in terms of the show. And that's what sort of what would be my invitation. What I would invite people to do in terms of the advice that we're giving is we would invite people to pick up at that discrete moment where there's something pressing happening so that players actually have something meaningful to do. Yeah. You indeed. Know? Indeed. Um, one of the things that, that I would be curious about, because we have all played now in a million games, I would just be curious, Dennis, maybe you can talk about some of your favorite scenes. Like, what have been some of the moments that sort of stick out in your mind um, in terms of, dis- like, taking it down to a discrete, excuse me, a discrete space? Scenes or moments? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you want to get really micro, like we we can talk moments. Um, but but I'm thinking, you know, because generally in terms of a scene, we're talking about um, room design. Like if you check out any of Hankern's videos, like you mentioned that earlier, room design, like go check out his videos on room design. We're talking about that DM section, uh, whether in the core or master edition, where he talks about sort of room setup like taking everything down to a discrete space with a timer threat and a treat, uh, that that sort of thing. But what are some of your favorites um, in terms of some of the games that we've played or that you've run? Yeah, there's been so many. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very blessed to have a very creative group that I get to play with. So it's, it, this is actually a tough question. Um, obviously, the Noodle House fight scene. That, that would, you can never go wrong with the Noodle House fight scene. Yeah, that, that, that was the start of Chuck's, just so people know, the start of Chuck's Altered State game. We we were in the Noodle House, right? Is that the one you're referring to? Yeah. And we're all in the Noodle House. We don't even know yet we're dealing with this thing called Ramsey's Corp. You know, we're in, we're in Cairo, I think. We yeah. don't even know we're dealing with Ramsey's Corp yet, but we're just in the Noodle House and craziness ensues. And yeah. I think it'd be fair to say it turned into a bloodbath. <laughs> um there there was a moment where you dennis as our wheel man you were crashing your car into the building to save us all so we could all yeah. jump in but like your brand new like sleek car although i think maybe you'd stolen it um yeah it was borrowed <laughs> yeah bar- right. borrowed yeah uh, yeah that that was an epic encounter all in a very discreet space noodle yeah. house a little bit of the street outside where the car is parked and that, that was, was it parking lot yeah that was it yeah, yeah. epic yeah. Um, obviously the, the one that Joe's referred to a bunch of times tonight about your character, top of the mountains. Um, I think any scene that has a lot going on that isn't one dimensional is, yeah. is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ones that allow characters to shine individually, I think mm-hmm. are important as well. I'm trying to think of all my, like, like I said, there's been so many good ones. Um, your character, Alex, drinking the tea in Mado, um, trying not to get stuck there forever and bluffing the uh, the uh, the right. demon down there that you had swallowed the tea. Yeah, holding it holding it in my mouth the whole time yeah. and trying to talk like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Making charisma yeah. rolls to try to not give it up. Right? Yeah, yeah. The, um, the scene that we had underneath the village where um, Joe's character got turned to stone Oh God, yeah. And carved the the kanji script the into his kanji. Feet. Uh, you guys are scrambling to keep him alive, and um, yeah. and that was just a very simple two minute tabletop map that I pulled of an underground cave scene that you found underneath a village house, yes. right, with an Umi living underneath it. Yeah, we'll um, send, send me a screenshot. We'll put it up so people can see. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll find that one. Um, yeah, that's yeah, a great There's one. just been so many over the over the years that um I one of my favorite if we get outside Ronan, because I I'm I I love that game. I had a great mm-hmm. time in that game, but if we get outside of that one, I think one of my favorite two the one where we fought the dragon where we left Chuck's dwarf as the, the yes 
with the treasure um, where we fought. That was the mechanics of that were fantastic. It was, it was super dangerous. You didn't want to get left out in the open, but there was room for my character to shine by running up and down the sides and firing in. And then Chuck shined by being a rogue with no, def, uh, no dexterity. And, um, you know, it, yep. uh, I'll remember that scene forever. Cause that's where we yeah. buried Chuck's character when, mm-hmm. when he died too, right? Yeah, uh, that became his mountain. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, the one, so one of my characters I played in your game, Demon Lands, was Ainsley, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, one of the few female characters I've ever played in my in my RPG lifetime. But there's a scene where um, uh, Joe's character, the uh, Orchard, was like, what was Orchard's first name? Abe. Abe. Abe Orchard. Yes. Yep. He Abe kind Orchard. of lost fate, and oh, yeah, and. It was after Chuck's dwarf had died and Ainsley had this thing of carving little faces into rocks. And I remember Abe was upset and um, I was able to hand him a rock with Chuck's dwarf um, carved into it. Yeah, and like that was seen all over remember, and it's not the mechanics of it. There was mm-hmm. things going on. We were in the, we we're up to our necks in, in, and um stress and everything else and but that's a that, that's one of the scenes i'll remember because it was yeah. character driven mechanics yeah. were put aside mm-hmm. character sheets were put aside the characters themselves show show through yeah yeah because that that whole moment that was you know Kurik had just died and and you know that that dragon lair had just become his tomb mm-hmm. and that that totally was a great that, that whole scene was great from that dragon fight leading into the carved Kurik stone because Abe was kind of heartbroken, distraught that Kurik had just fallen. That, yes. that was great. Well, a and, great, great yeah. moment, a great scene. And I think to take this back to the topic a little bit, like those were all in discrete spaces. Like, yeah. like never did I plan in terms of those spaces. Like I, I hadn't had this necessarily huge concept of the world and been like, oh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be this like I didn't need all that to have an epic moment and to have an epic scene in terms of in terms of a game. And similarly in the Ronin game, so to let the cat out of the bag and and to de- to describe it for everyone, Dennis ran this gorgeous scene where we were climbing up to the top of the mountain and at the top of the mountain was my character Kayo Kazuto's nemesis, uh yes. o- o- Obara, I think. Um who had basically said, you know, Kaya, you just, des- you know, you stole from the clan, you deserted the clan, like he was hurling all these insults, and wanted me to come up and fight to like to duel him, like once and for all. And meanwhile, there were all these like spirits who were, I mean, ridiculously powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were sapping everybody's strength. They were like slicing through everybody. There was also out in the storm surrounding this mountain with this huge precipice uh there was this dragon kind of spirit that was kind of weaving in and out and kind of attacking us and the the whole thrust of the encounter was to make your way up the mountain and deal with this guy which which chuck's character did like uh kin kin kinshin kinjin yeah kenshin kinshin he he climbed the whole mountain and got struck down by this guy yeah and it was epic because my character Kaio Kazuto just sort of leaned back and crossed his arms and was just like, you know, no, I'm not coming up. Yeah, I mean, you like, because I, I, I definitely like, I loved that scene. I remember it. Like, you were down, you know, there was it was cliff faces. We had space down here and like a, a walk up, and the the bad guy was here. So there was like, there was just open air between them. You kind of <laughs> had to make your way all the way around this thing. The, the and S- tension S- stayed. S- right down here at this bottom leaning against a tory gate just like you know <laughs> come on i'm not even gonna pull my sword you're not worth my time really just goading him the whole time as as the rest of us went through dealing with these other threats and kenshin's focus stayed on that guy and it was great because you had this huge moment to shine and the rest of us were you know we were i i don't know if like i don't know we were we were all so into it like i just know that like that was like a shining moment and uh we were we were dealing with those other threats so you could continue that thing because it was so good and that we took the thousand cuts 
like <laughs> took the killing blow without ever raise, raising the sword and but, like the whole thing like you said like storm raging around the mountaintop we're crossing along through the thing and just oh, man, i don't well, it was good it was well, so good well yeah because so kaya's whole thing was like you know obara do everything do nothing i don't care what you do like strike us down yeah. like whatever like you're not worth my time you're like you're a yep. you're insignificant to me like you're come over here and strike us down yeah like you're come nothing you're nothing compared to my comrades Right. And, and like that guy's ego, like couldn't take it. And he ended up hurling himself into the abyss. And it was just so epic, Dennis, as DM, that you like played into that. You know, you kind of got what we were trying to do. You got what Kaya was trying to do to sort of dishonor this guy and, and, and just and really just played into it. And ultimately, he, you know, he committed suicide and threw himself off the cliff. And, and so, you know, like the legend of Kaya, right, was that he defeated his nemesis and he never even drew his blade. I get I get goosebumps thinking about it. It, know, right? it. it might have been the most impactful moment as a character that I've ever been in. Um, it, it's still probably my number one scene. And yeah. again, to take it back to our topic, like it, it didn't matter in terms of the whole world necessarily. We just knew that there that Kaio had this nemesis. We met him at the top of this mountain doing some evil stuff, but it was still a discrete space. It all you yeah. had to plan for that night of play or at least that encounter was just the mountain and and it was brilliant and gorgeous um I, it was epic so and to be honest didn't go how i planned i <laughs> never I does had, <laughs> no i had the the cherry the sakura tree at the top of the mountain with the dueling ring ready for you mm -hmm. and you know, but i i think that's important as a dm to recognize that just because you have something on paper that this is how the scene needs to go, it never needs to go that way. Yes. I would argue that this is a thousand times a better story than if you had to fought him in that circle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All, all Kayo did was ultimately he walked up the mountain, put his arm around Kenshin and walked him down the mountain and like turned his back on that dude. And that, that dude got in a few like cuts to the back, which was completely dishonorable. Yep. You know, and Kayo just kept on walking and then, you know, then it, it settled in like, you know, kind of where he where he fell in Kayo's world, which was less than nothing. And that he completely dishonored himself, you know, when it when it mattered. And so the only conclusion was he he had to jump off. It, it, it was epic. Yeah, no, great, <laughs> like, it great, was great epic. Scene. Yeah, really great scene, all in a confined space. None of that magic could have happened if Dennis had like sort of overplanned all this stuff. Even his small planning, it didn't play out the way he thought that it would. Um, players will surprise you that way, folks. They will. So right, think and let them. Yeah, let them. Like give into those moments. One of the greatest things Dennis did was let that story unfold the way it unfolded. You know. Yeah. But. But think in these small spaces where these beautiful moments can happen. Yep. Yeah. We had another uh, one like that. If you remember, Joe, when your character fell off the pagoda at the library, and oh, was dying gosh, yeah. all, right? So that that you know, we had a five-story pagoda, mm -hmm. and everybody was spread out throughout it, accomplishing different things. And you went out after one of the bad guys, rolled a one, fell off. Right. Now which it completely died at the bottom, but then we had another great moment where by being fluid as players and GMs, uh, Chuck was able to ride a stream of cherry tree petals down to save you, right? Yes. By yeah. not sticking to the book and not sticking to the rules, but sticking to the theme and the spirit of what those rules are. Right. Yeah. I think the uh, one of the other great things, I mean, it was almost more, it was, you know, a little character in RP side was Ginjiro was afraid of heights. <laughs> he did not like heights at all. And 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 the impact of the the things that were happening in that space that you know that you had designed, because it was just these small pagoda floors. And that guy that he was chasing, you know, popped out the thing. And Ginjiro at the moment was so focused on, you know, this guy can't get away. We kind of need him to solve our issue that's going on, you know, as these only are coming through and everything. I think only were on their way to the town um like shortly after that so like and those are things we could see and Ginjiro following him out and realizing he was on the stairs and then like the best time or realizing how high up he was and the best time not one to fall for a character afraid of heights I mean just 
it was like this cacophony of perfect events that all led into, I guess, reaffirming his, you know, complete belief on heights are terrible and people should not, should not be climbing that high ever. Like, I don't know, the whole thing was great. And then, like you said, like, you know, uh, allowing Chuck to float down from the top of this five, you know, five floors up pagoda on those, uh, on those cherry blossoms. Like it, that, that was a great scene again with those confined spaces and, and everything. Those well, discreet I, I'm sensing a theme in terms of Dennis's games, like crazy stuff happens when you're up really high. <laughs> um, but I will say, right. Like that is a very discreet story beat, a very discreet yeah. space. You're up on a really high place yep. and man, like you don't need a huge thing. You just need a small precipice and amazing stuff and happens. Beautiful the stuff other thing, happens. Like, we were spread out too because it was multiple floors. I think the rest of you guys were still a floor or maybe even two below because I had kept going up and up and up and I was up there with this guy alone. And look what happens when you split the party. You fall off the roof of the freaking pagoda and almost die. But you know, Chuck had, uh, Chuck's character, that's right, Kenshin had just come up and watched whoop, Genjiro go over the edge. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, and, and, shit. and saved him in the moment, which is epic. Right? epic yep um i would just say yeah, a great space there are a few two that stand out to me by the way in terms of some of the epic games that we played one of which was the gi joe game <laughs> and dennis was duke and there's this moment where you encounter firefly in this room full of munitions and snake eyes springs off into the shadows and you know, I think Roadblock is readying his big gun, right? And Duke charges straight up the middle with his fist back, like, yo, Joe! And it's like <laughs> about to punch Firefly's lights out, even though there are a ton of Cobra guards everywhere, right? Again, discrete space. We're in a room full of mu munitions. There are a ton of Cobra guards. There's Firefly, the demolition, Cobra demolition expert right there. And what does Duke do? classic to the cartoon straight up the gut you know like and everybody is like oh crap well he's going like we all gotta go you know <laughs> right, let's get in there joe <laughs> right like yeah like let's get in there like to me that's epic and again small space small Ooh. space and to cycle back that's a commander absolutely it's that's a commander. completely a commander build Absolutely. And Charges was, right in and pulled all of us with him. Well, and I think he had the ability, which was every time you say your special catchphrase, like everybody around you gets an easy roll. So, yep, right. you know, like his action was like, yo, Joe. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Joe, the game you ran in terms of our Reptoid game, like Dennis, I know you weren't there, but in terms of our Reptoid game, we're on the space station. And everybody else is just getting crushed by the security personnel. And Master Graz, like the old sort of slow-moving master, gets into the ship. And he's trying to make it to where everybody else can get on the ship and escape. The self-destruct timer was counting down. We had maybe two rounds before the whole place blew. And the ship is now surrounded by guards. Yeah. And Graz makes it to the control panel. And he's just like, you know, I know. I'm just going to, like, tap on the joystick to, like like spin the ship yeah. so that the gangplank in the back like whips around so that the other guys can get on and it's gonna the the wings are gonna knock all these guards down right like, epic moment like you're yes we're in a space station like you know the death star but we just need the hangar and some of the surrounding rooms to have this epic moment yeah, you know that's that's uh, one of one of my favorite scenes. Also, uh, you know, I was I was running that game, but watching you guys like handle that space because I mean there was multiple different characters, and uh, both um, both Xander and Matt had a little bit higher mobility. Uh, Matt, I think more so, had like crazy high ability or uh, mobility and stealth, and he had been going around whoop, and like unseen <laughs> with uh, with Xander's character kind of like you know, flitting through and, and managing to remain hidden. And the moment before you, before you did the, the ship spin, before you like just whipped the thing, there was that moment where Xander's character was hiding. Matt's character was coming through. Uh, B's character, Hankerin, was standing out there with, you know, with, with his very, very like, uh, 
front presence, you know, I, I guess kind of a commander character. He's you know, so he was standing out the there tank. like, yeah, cool. yeah, he was the tank and he was like insulting these guys, calling them out like, you know, let's have a one on one. I'm going to smoke each one of you guys in line. Uh, yes. And then there was that thing where uh, and this was one of my favorite bits. Uh, and, and, and as game masters, this is why you always like, just trust your players. Like you, you should have a great, you know, openness to their suggestions because there's that moment where I think you wanted to warn Xander's character. So master Graz is there and he's, and, and you, you had said to me, I want to communicate with him. You know, we're, we're reptoids. We have these claws. I want to scratch. I just want to scratch on the window on the glass uh you know in our secret language this coded language um i think there was some reference to you know like being back uh uh back as like uh, clutch mates mm -hmm. scratches in the eggs talking to the you know the the rest of the uh you know folks in their eggs these reptoids in their eggs and it was just that moment of telling him hey watch out i'm gonna do some crazy you know ish right now uh that scratch language like that is one of like my key things where i'm like mm -hmm. wow Wow. <laughs> yep. Yes, of course that happens. Roll me a charisma to see if uh to see if he'll be able to get there. Or I think I had Xander roll a whiz to see if he could hear it with exactly. everything else going. Exactly. And that like became a whole thing with this scratch code language that I think later Xander even used to communicate to there was a whole parallel dimensions, a lot of parallels, but Xander used the scratch thing to communicate across the parallels to other versions of himself. Yep. Uh, later on that helped pull things in. like that was just madness yeah it's epic it was so great um but that same scene with that tiny little instance i, I want to talk I about it. one more and maybe if you guys have some and then we'll kind of wrap up because we've been at this for yeah. a little while oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to talk about the chub chub moment because we we reference it chub all chubs. the time uh in the discord and chub i'll chubs. i'll put the shot up um so dennis when you're watching this back later like you can see too but in essence uh, we were in the, we, we were we were doing like the Red Dawn Part Two, the Argent Dawn storyline with Hankering. Yeah, yep. Our team had gone in to investigate what was going on with these ships, and we ended up in this sort of central area just before the bridge that was completely overgrown uh, with yeah. this sort of tangle, like this um, this mutation that was happening to the ship. Mm -hmm. So we're entangled in this. We're fighting these like vines or whatever. And from the bridge, the chub chubs come running out. They're like these insectoid like things. They're one hit point each, but they're literally probably 60 of them on screen. Yeah, it was a swarm enemy for and certain. So they're one hit point, but if they hit you, they instantly do one hit point damage. There's no roll. If they touch you, you take damage. And, and so they're latched on, and you have to get them off. Yeah, so it was crazy. And the swarm is coming at you. My character, the giant robot, activated the airlock to try to pull, to try to suck them out. He ends up, he ends up getting sucked out into space, drifting right. away from the spaceship. Nothing to do. Xander's character, um, oh shoot, what was his name? Yeah, uh, it was Sharp. Uh, yeah, Derek Sharp. Derek um, Sharp. You know, yeah, if Arturo it, was you. Yeah, if you're door. if you're not if you're if it's not Sharp, it's dull. Like he's the he's the leader of this uh, or the president and CEO of this munitions and tech company he goes down because he's kind of frail um joe's uh character yeah it was the kit Pac. it was, was the, the pilot kit pilot <laughs> he gets overwhelmed and and goes yeah. down and and that's it and the chub chubs just overwhelmed us in that room right. and took us out again well i i also went down because arturo you know your your robot that was Pac's buddy uh, I was rushing to save you to try and launch out my grapple winch to grab a hold to be able to pull you back in. And yeah, and that's when I was overwhelmed by Chub Jubs. Yeah. And, and we TPK'd there. Yeah. But it was amazing. Yeah. So it was that was a master edition play testing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we were play testing the, the, the new character classes before they ever made it into, into master edition. And we just got overwhelmed again. A super memorable moment. We talk about it all the time. There are tons of references on it in the Runehammer Discord. Um, and it all came down to that discrete space. Yeah. So I, I think to maybe wrap this up in a nice bow, unless you guys have any other thing to say, is I would just say there are tons of beautiful moments that can ha happen in very small spaces. And as DMs, 
They're easier to plan. They're easy to implement. They're a great way in terms of thinking that scene mentality in the show, like what's important yeah. now in terms of giving your character something cool to do yep. and, and beautiful, beautiful moments can unfold. And, yeah. and, that and you would... didn't have to build the whole world for that to happen. <laughs> yep. You built these small spaces. These memorable moments happen in very small spaces. And that's that would be, I think, our advice. I think universally. But mm -hmm. um, Dennis, any any fi final thoughts or, or final uh, pieces, um, moments of wisdom that you would uh, you would have for our audience? No, I, I think this has been a pretty lengthy conversation uh, and a good one. Um, no, for me, it, it's it's simple. Like, just hit hit your players in the fields because they're going to make them invested. Yeah. Um, I prefer the use of scenes and, and a few a night. Um, mm -hmm. It's easier for me. I'm I'm extremely busy. I have a very busy job and a very busy uh, life outside of work. So, and and players tend to go off script. So, if you oh, only have a night planned and one that you're thinking of in the future when it goes sideways and you go a different direction then you're not you're not stressed out and buried um and the biggest one like i said earlier was just find something that you enjoy run that genre and find the people that you want to play with there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people available for people to play with if you're willing to go online or willing to put yourself out there Find the group that makes you feel happy playing the game. Right? It's it's not the Pringles, it's the people. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and they don't even have to have 100% similar similar interests. You know, I've, as we've seen, we've got, you know, uh, Dennis, you're, you love that feudal Japan, the storyline, the element, the history and that. Uh, Alex, like deep in with the sci-fi, with those aliens, you know, the, the, the predator, uh, like with the xenomorphs, you know, all those kind of things, plus the demon lands. Uh, and... I'm a pulp head, you know, but so like, it's not that we're all focused in the same thing, but you know, like, like Dennis had said, we, we, we like each other's company. We enjoy sitting around the table and there's a trust built. We trust that whatever the game is going to be, you know, we trust that it's going to, uh, it's going to be geared and designed and made to work with us. Like, we, cause we all want to be there. And and both of these guys are wonderful at putting those little nuggets that that really kind of focus and shine and give you the things that you want to see in a game. Uh, and that comes from just, you know, for, for one, we, we enjoy each other's company. And that really kind of started the whole thing on why we, we were gaming, you know, pretty much every weekend uh, through all of these myriad of stories into cyberpunk, into G.I. Joe, into Robotech, you know, all of these different kinds of games that we have played. And it's it's all, you know, because we found people that we enjoy playing with and, and we, we are focused on things that are close to our heart to, to quote Dennis again. I mean, man, I got nothing else to add. <laughs> I'm just praising the two of you. I got nothing. <laughs> I know. Uh, praise goes to you guys. Uh, we are very blessed, but I would just say, um, I think if all hearts and minds are clear, this is probably a good place to cut it. Uh, lots of good advice. Dennis, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, man, you have dropped a ton of DM wisdom and gold uh, uh, for the group. And I, I think uh, I think people will be really, uh, really perceptive of what you have to say. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Ooh. Yeah, so I, I guess. Joe? I guess it feels like, yeah, it feels like the moment. So folks, uh, until next time, Take my hero coin and always roll ultimate. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>